All right, let's go ahead and get started. So thank you for coming to this session. My name is James Shore, and I have been leading Agile teams for 12 and a half years now, which, uh, where's the time go, right? Uh, I am a, I'm currently acting as a consultant and coach. I tend to work with small and medium-sized companies, companies up to about 200 people. And uh, I wrote a book called The Art of Agile Development, and um, I'm here to talk to you today about large-scale Agile development. Uh, now, I'm going to please feel free to stop me and ask questions as we go. I left enough time for, for lots of questions. And it's, the things that we're going to talk about, are, some of them are a bit complicated, so please don't hesitate. Um, the first question I get is, what do I mean by large-scale Agile? What exactly is large-scale Agile? And I want to be really clear that I'm not talking about enterprise Agile. Enterprise Agile is when people, well, step one, hire a Scrum trainer. Step two, train everyone in Scrum. Step three, we're not sure. Step four, step five, step six, soul crushing defeat, move on. Yeah, so I'm not talking about that. When I say large-scale Agile, what I mean is interdependent teams. That is, multiple Agile teams that have to work together in some way. How many, how many teams? More than one. How many people? More than one. So you can have large-scale Agile with a five-person company if you have five independent teams of one person each. That's not credibly incredibly good idea, but that would be large-scale Agile in a very small environment. You can also have large-scale Agile with five 10-person teams and 50 programmers total. My experience, once again, is with teams of about, or organizations of about 100 to 200 people, and about half of those people are programmers. So typically, 50 to 100 programmers. Uh, I have worked with organizations that have thousands of programmers. I worked with a company in Europe that does cell phones that has thousands of programmers and are trying to do Agile, but they were more on the enterprise Agile scale of the spectrum than they were on the large scale Agile. With that many people, it was just, they, it was hard for them to do Agile well. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, we're going to have some theory. We're going to, it's based on some experiences of mine, and there's a fair amount of how can we apply this? There's, so there's some speculation in this talk, too. And I'll try to be clear about what's been tested and what's speculation. But this is all early adopter stuff. This isn't proven, you know, everybody's done large-scale Agile in this way. Let's just go do it. If you're going to try these ideas, and I hope you will take them and try them, uh, just be aware that there's lots of things that I think are still left to be learned about how this works. So let's start out talking about manufacturing. Traditional manufacturing, you know, the assembly line was a, a great innovation. And as people put it into practice, they did discover some challenges. A really common problem in a large manufacturer, in a traditional manufacturing environment, is that you've got some expensive machine that feeds some time intensive process. And in traditional manufacturing, expensive machines were considered to be cheaper if they were run all the time. I don't really understand the accounting logic behind that, but it was generally accepted. So you would want to run that expensive machine constantly. Meanwhile, the process that depends on that inventory is going fairly slowly. So you're building up a large pile of inventory between your expensive machine and your time-intensive process. And that's a problem, because if you've introduced any sort of defect, or if you need to change in response to a customer demand, maybe they're screaming because they got something defective and they want, they want something new. If you want to put that change in, you've got a big pile of inventory that you have to work through before you get to the new stuff that's ready for, uh, that, that reflects the change you want. So you can either work through that pile, which is delay, or you can set it aside 
and start working on the, the new material and then come back to the old material later. The problem is, is that this inventory is physical. It's, it's made out of metal or, or something else. And it's, it's sitting in your yard and it's rusting. Or it has defects. Or there's something else wrong. So by the time you get back to it, some of that inventory has gone to waste. And if you actually had a defect but you didn't discover it until later on, you'd have to throw it all away. So that's really expensive and not effective. And this is a problem that people were struggling with uh, in the 80s or so. There was a lot of con concern about how do we manage inventory, how do we utilize our machines effectively, and so forth. If you've ever read the book uh, The Goal by Eli Goldratt, uh, this is a great story about this problem. It talks about something called theory of constraints from the perspective of manufacturing and inventory and dealing with this problem of uh, inventory piling up. In addition to just being wasteful and you, you losing money as a result of inventory literally rotting on you, uh, finding space for that inventory costs a lot of money. So, at Toyota, under Taichi Ono, they wanted to do something different. They created something where, uh, called lean manufacturing, and their ideal was one-piece flow. One-piece flow is no inventory. The whole system builds exactly as much as they can build at every step of the way. So you never bring in more than you need. You're just sending pieces through. So if you need to have a change, well, you just do it. The next opportunity, you, you send the change through. There's no inventory building up. There's no waste. There's no loss. And you're not paying for the space. Now, one piece flow is, is hard to achieve in reality. So the folks at Toyota, I, I said they called it lean manufacturing. It's actually the Toyota production system. Other people applied it and called it lean manufacturing. But uh, the folks at Toyota created this really neat trick that everybody loves. And it's called Kanban. Uh, how many of you have heard of Kanban in relationship to software? Yeah. Everybody loves Kanban. Maybe because the word's Japanese, maybe because it's just cool, I don't know. But Kanban uh, is how Toyota solved the problem of one piece flow in the real manufacturing world. And the way it works is Kanban means sign or billboard or. Uh, brand, in a way. It's not just sign, but it also represents the, the integrity of the business that's associated with. Um, and what it is, is it's a signal that we need, we need some work done. So a uh, Kanban can be anything. Let's say it's an empty bin. So on this manufacturing line here, the, organization, uh, the customer wants something built, so they send in an empty bin. The station sees the bin. This station here sees the bin, so they build it. And then that creates an empty Kanban here, so they send that upstream, which is a signal to this station to build something. So they build something. That creates an empty Kanban here, so they send it upstream. It's a signal for this guy to, to build something, and so forth. And then that all gets shipped out. That's the idea behind Kanban is Kanban is an empty bin, a placeholder for you to put inventory in. And you don't build anything until you get that empty Kanban. Now, in practice, I was showing it step by step. But in practice, it all happens simultaneously. And it's really cool, actually. Everything just sort of automatically flows through. And, uh, but only at the speed that the system can handle. There's no inventory building up because you can't put more than one thing or five things or however many in the Kanban bin. And if you want to bring in a different type of inventory or a different uh, step or a change or something like that, you can do it, just like with one piece flow. So the goal of Kanban here is to emulate one piece flow within the constraints of the real world. And the fewer Kanban you have, the closer you get to one piece flow. 
And it's just fun to watch. I mean, I, I call this the dance of the Kanban. Because, you know, everything's sort of bouncing back and forth. It's all automatic. And that automaticness of it, and also the fact that I think, it, I think the fact that it's Japanese and therefore trendy, um, means that people really focus on Kanban. Kanban, Kanban, Kanban. Kanban isn't important. Kanban is a means to the end. And the end is one piece flow. What we want to do here is develop a learning organization that will find ways to reduce the number of Kanban. So Kanban is something we want to get rid of, not be proud of. What we want is one piece flow. And at Toyota, they came up with an approach to, give, to allow them to have one piece flow. Um, but before I talk about that, I said I wanted to stop for questions throughout. Uh, so are there any questions so far about how Kanban works? Yeah, so the question is, uh, how do you, in using lean manufacturing, uh, how do you keep this expensive machine running at capacity? Well, there's two things. First, we don't use cost accounting, so we don't think that it's most effective to run it all, all the time. Uh, instead, we use throughput accounting, which says that we make more money when we ship things frequently rather than running the machines all the time. And uh, I'm not going to go into the math and... and finances behind it, but it works better than cost accounting. Um, the other thing is, is if it's expensive to, you don't want to, perhaps you don't want to turn this machine on for five minutes and then turn it off for ten minutes and then turn it on for five minutes. Uh, that's where the Kanban come in. The number of Kanban you use helps control how frequently you run this machine. The fewer Kanban you have, the closer you get to one piece flow but the physical constraints of the real world might prevent you from doing just one thing at a time. Does that answer your question? OK. Any other questions about Kanban and lean manufacturing and how that works? OK. So we want to get rid of Kanban. We'll just let that go right on by one more time. So in Toyota, they didn't just use Kanban. They also had a really central idea called the Lean Work Cell. And the purpose of the Lean Work Cell is to create one piece flow in a segment of the organization. So between work cells, you would use Kanban to coordinate. But within a work cell, people would just take their work and self-organize around delivering that work, moving one piece at a time and keeping their inventories low. Uh, and I think it's really interesting. Uh, Toichi Ono talks about uh, this experience. He says, we arranged the machines in parallel lines or in an L shape and tried having one worker operate three or four machines. Our craftsmen did not like the new arrangement requiring them to function as multi-skilled operators. I find that the parallels there really fascinating because in the early days of Agile, when extreme programming was very popular, the first thing an extreme programming coach would do would be to come into the organization and move all the walls around tear down the cubes. There was actually advice to, if you couldn't get facilities to move the cubes for you, to come in on a weekend with a screwdriver. Uh, XP was very subversive <laughs> in, in that way. It was pretty much the opposite of Enterprise Agile. Um, well, the first thing a lean coach or a, a TPS, Toyota Production System, uh, sensei will do when they come in is they will look at the location of the machinery and they'll physically move the machinery to form work cells so a single worker can operate multiple machines simultaneously. And in extreme program, we would physically move the people, create open workspaces for teams, not for everybody, but for each team, and so the teams could work together and work on multiple things simultaneously and, and have uh, generalizing specialists. So, and, uh, so I was one of the people doing stuff like that. Um, and I did see the same kind of reaction that people sort of had a uh, were turned off by the idea of being generalized specialists. If I'm a database guy, I really just want to do databases. I don't want to have to do JavaScript, which, you know, could be understandable. Okay. So that's lean manufacturing. Any, uh, any questions about that, this whole concept of lean manufacturing in the Toyota production system? 
Okay. Let's talk about software development. Traditional software development has been renamed from waterfall, that's bad, to phase gate lifecycle, that's enterprise. <laughs> Same old stuff. Uh, so this is real, people still do this, they still think this is a good idea. Just a couple months ago I was working with a large database manufacturer and they were talking about their agile life cycle and using this to demonstrate it. Um, and that's, you know, concept, requirements, design, build, and test, release. And what you see in this traditional phase gate life cycle is the exact same thing you see in traditional manufacturing, which is that inventory piles up between stages. So you've got a big requirement, and by inventory I mean unfinished work. So you've got a big pile of requirements in a requirements document waiting for design work to be done. And then you've got a big pile of boxy diagrams done by the, the ultra smart architects who have now moved on to something else waiting to be programmed. And now you've got a big pile of code that doesn't work waiting to be uh, reprogrammed at the direction of the testers. And then you got a big pile of tested code that nobody can use because it needs to go through the deployment process. So these big piles of inventory and the same sort of waste and delay that you get in traditional manufacturing as well. Because uh, if a change comes in, you've got all this stuff that has to be finished before you can get to that change. And if you're to set that work aside and go work on the new thing, you get rot. The, the inventory dies, technical debt because you can't just set aside software, go work on something else and come back to it and expect everything to be okay uh, if you're working, still working the same system. To accommodate this, how many of you are familiar with resource shaping? Well, I guarantee nobody raised their hand, which is interesting, except for Arlo. Um, resource shaping is the worst idea in the history of mankind. All of you have experienced the terrible effects of resource shaping. But the idea of resource shaping is that if we're going to have a bunch of business analysts doing requirements, then a bunch of really smart architects doing architecture, and then a bunch of people doing programming, and then a bunch of people doing testing, we've got to sort of balance things out so that when these people are done programming this project, this project is ready to go. And we're going to time everything very carefully. We know how all that works in software, right? We're going to time things really carefully so this project's all done programming right when this one's ready to start programming and the architects are going to move off that and onto this and you have, well, sort of these hills that show who's working on what at any given time. The problem is, is if at any point things take a little longer than expected, that never happens. Everything's messed up, you know. Now this project is ready for programmers and it's got people screaming for it to get done because they've already spent a year in requirements and design. So it really needs programmers, but the programmers are all busy on these other projects. And that's where the lovely idea of the full-time equivalent came from. Full-time equivalent says that if you have five programmers 20% of the time on the project, that is just as good as one programmer 100% of the time. Who? <laughs> what kind of idiot came up with this idea? I mean, really? I was on a, I worked with a company um, that was extremely dysfunctional. Uh, I won't mention their name, but I guarantee you every single one of you has used their software to manage your finances. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and they, they, I was working on a project for them and uh, they, we needed database administrator, database help. And so they said, okay, well, we'll assign this guy. He's already 120% allocated, but you can have him 2% of the time. <laughs> 2% of his time. I did the math. Assuming that he works a 40-hour week, 2% of the week is 48 minutes per week that I could work with this database guy who's 120% allocated. I don't know what they were thinking or how we were supposed to get any use out of this. So resource shaping leads to full-time employees, full-time, em or uh, not full-time employees, <laughs> it leads to people leaving. It leads to uh, full-time equivalence, which um, is the worst idea in the history of software development and maybe the world. So, Agile is a reaction to this insanity. 
there's a lot of similarities between Agile and Lean, and I think they were inspired by some of the same materials, but Agile in the early days was not an attempt to apply Lean to software development. They went on parallel tracks. And in fact, Lean is for manufacturing. I don't know that Toyota has really uh, figured out how to apply Lean to design work like, like software development. I know that Don Reinertsen is working on that. I haven't read his books yet, but he's, he's working on it, and I hear very good things about his stuff. Uh, at any rate, in Agile, we don't do the phase gate stuff. Now, there is some ceremony. We've got iteration demos and retrospectives, and we do a little planning. But the vast majority of the iteration is spent developing, and developing is, well, planning, analysis, design code, test, and deployment automation all the time simultaneously. For example, test-driven development is going to be design, code, and test, and a little bit of documentation, too, all simultaneously. Uh, every time you check into your integrated build, you should be updating your automated deployment. So you're doing all this work simultaneously. So we don't have this phase gate issue. It's uh, much closer to one-piece flow. We're also working with cross-functional teams. So now we've got the business folks on the team with our programmers. We've got our testers on the team with our programmers. We have our programmers who've got this cool gear animation. I just love that one. <laughs> and they're all working together, which means that we don't have to wait for the requirements of the business analysts to become available because we've got subject matter experts on the team. We've got a product manager on the team. So we don't have to say, we'll do this once somebody is available because they're all part of the team. So resource shaping for Agile is fairly simple. We are either not working on your stuff, or we are working on your stuff. <laughs> All or none. And that's the whole team, 100%. Now, there are need for specialists, and you might ask somebody to join your team for a week or two, like if you're doing security and you need uh, some help with exploratory testing, security, and so forth. But uh, it's a much simpler environment. And what's neat about this is that uh, in this environment, the resource, this, the core resource that you assign to projects isn't the person. It isn't 2% of your database engine, your database person, which, you know, 2% is like an ear. And a getting, cutting off that guy's ear and, you know, putting it in our team room wouldn't have been about as helpful. Rather than splitting people up into these imaginary resources, this, this wishful thinking that we can go to the programmer vending machine, put in 50 cents, and get a programmer, now the resource is the team. Now we assign teams to products or projects. And 2% of the time on a project means that this team is going to work on the next release, which is going to take a week, and then they're going to do something else for a year. And in that 2%, in that one week, once they start that, they're going to be on it full time and they will get it all the way done. And then apparently it's not important enough to work on for another year. Which can happen. So the result here, the result here is basically one piece flow. Now this diagram is a bit complicated. It comes from my training course that I do for planning. but. Um, what you see here is the team's working on one releasable feature, one MMF, and breaking that down, decomposing it in a sort of continuous flow environment. Now, this, this environment is for iterations, but you can also do the same thing in a continuous flow style, uh, the so-called Kanban style. So any questions about this piece? What do you mean by load balance? Well, you're putting your team on this particular project or the next project. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe this project is more content intensive. Mm -hmm. Or maybe this project is more, you know, database query intensive or whatever specialty you, you know, how do you adjust for that? Yeah. So the question is, how do you load balance your project? Uh, what do you do if you've got one, one project that's really front end intensive and one project that's really database intensive? Um, there's a couple of things. One is we tend to not work on projects, but products. And so a team will be assigned to a product long term, and the needs of the product tend not to change. So you build the team for the product. 
Um, if you're in an environment where you've got lots of little projects, you probably have several teams and you'd, apply, you'd assign the appropriate team to the appropriate project. Uh, also, on an Agile team, we want to have what we call T-shaped people or generalizing specialists so that everybody has some competence in all parts of uh, all the technology that you use in the types of projects that you care about or that team's likely to work on. Uh, and then finally, if you really need some help, you bring somebody in to work with the team and help increase their, their skill levels. But it would still be, uh, that would still be the core team. You can add people or take people off a team uh, slowly over time if you want, although it's more effective to keep teams intact long term. Does that answer your question? So um, basically it comes down to understand why we're doing things this way and then there's, it's, there's, it's not rigid. You know, you change the process to work the way that your organization needs to work. As long as you understand why we keep long-lived teams and, and the goals of resource, uh, the, the all or nothing resource shaping and so forth. So any other questions about uh, Agile? Now I want to be clear, I'm talking about a particular type, type of Agile, that is Agile done well. I'm not talking about the type of Agile that's done when you've got somebody who's been to a two-day Scrum course. Uh, so, and that's not to beat on Scrum. Scrum is a great starting point, but it's insufficient. So in addition to the Scrum ideas of sprints and stand-ups, we're also talking about Agile engineering. We're talking about test-driven development and refactoring and continuous integration. We're also talking about product management. Some of the ideas from Lean Startup are really interesting, but also just having somebody on the team who's responsible for the product as part of the team, not a product owner who comes in once every two weeks, but actual business expertise on the team. So, I think there's a lot of parallels between the Agile team and the Lean Work Cell. A Lean Work Cell gives you one piece flow, and an Agile team gives you one piece flow. So what do you do, and it works really well if you have just one team, but what do you do when you have more than one team? I think the relationship between the Agile team, the similarity between the Agile team and the Lean Work Cell is similar, is the same similarity you see between large-scale Agile and the Lean system. So we can take some of the ideas from Lean and apply them to large-scale Agile. Now, it doesn't apply perfectly. And we can't make the mistake of thinking the software development's like manufacturing because it's not at all like manufacturing. But we can use some of the ideas from Lean. And I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. There's also a corollary here. If a large-scale Agile system is made up of work cells, then to do large-scale Agile well, you must first do single-team Agile well. If you can't do Agile well at the single team level, you're not going to have a lot of luck doing Agile well with multiple teams. So the core idea here is to create work cells and then coordinate those teams using lean techniques, um, particularly Kanban. Uh, and that's what I want to show you next. So if we imagine a manufacturing line, and when we apply that to software, what we get is something that might look like this. A professional services team that's responsible for customizing your software for particular clients. A core product team that's responsible for building the core product, and then maybe some sort of back-end database team uh, to, to do the database schema and so forth. I said that this is a poor example. It's not, I mean, it's a reasonable way of applying large-scale Agile, and I think it's an example of how there are lots of different ways to apply these ideas. But the reason I say this is poor because, because there's a lot of handoffs here, and every handoff is an opportunity for delay, an opportunity for increased inventory. So instead, I would rather create vertical slices, teams that are responsible for a particular market segment or type of problem. Uh, some folks call this feature teams, but that term has been, uh, it's actually been used to mean two completely opposite things by different people. Uh, Yuta Eckstein uses it in this way, and Boss Bodhi uses it in a different sense. So I'm just going to call these 
uh, market teams or something similar, vertical slices. Teams that are responsible for building complete products for a particular slice of the market. So uh, in this example, one team is, might be building reports, another team might be building the core product, a night, another team might be focused on migrating customers to the newest version of the software. And coordinating this, uh, let's say for this product that there's integration work needed before you deliver this, so they're delivering to a program team. Now even better would be as if each of these teams talked to customers directly uh, and didn't have any integration step because then there's no handoff between here and here. But then I, if I did that, I couldn't show you any pretty animations and I want to do that. So <laughs> it will illustrate the ideas. Uh, the next step gets a little complicated. So are we all good up to this point? Any questions about this so far? How do you handle the Right. Yeah, so the question is, what do you do about dependencies between, say, customer mm -hmm. ports and core product? Um, I didn't put that on this slide because I wanted to start out with a really simple example, but that is, that is common. Um, and the way you would deal with that is the same as the way you deal with the dependency between the program team and the, and the other team. So I'm going to illustrate that in a moment. Um, but the more handoffs you have, the more dependencies you have, the more complex things get and the more delays you have. So as much as possible, we want to eliminate those handoffs. But that's a question of design, and it's, I think it's the art of this, and I think that's where a lot of uh, work needs to still be done and discover the best way to come up with those, those organizational patterns. Any other questions about this before I get into the, the flow of it? Okay. So the idea here is agile teams like work cells that are completely responsible for their slice of the universe, coordinating with Kanban. So a customer request comes in, and that signals the program team to build something. Now, unlike manufacturing, we couldn't have inventory just sitting here waiting, because we're not building the same thing every time. So we don't know what to build until that customer request comes in. So now that that customer request has come in, we can send out our Kanban bins, we can send out our request to each of the teams. And they can start working on it. Meanwhile, we're going to take this bin and say, we're working on that. That's what we're going to build right now. Which gives us the opportunity to say, well, what's next? What's the next customer request that we want to look at after this? And the reason we want to do that will become apparent, apparent in a moment. These three teams are going to work simultaneously, but for the ease of understanding, I've done it just one at a time. So your custom reports team builds their piece of this overall product, and they send it back. And the program team takes that and starts integrating it. Meanwhile, that custom reports bin can go back because we've got our next request queued up. So we can send this bin back to the, to the customer reports team and say, here's what we want you to work on next. And that's how we get the inventory lined up like in the same way that we do manufacturing. It's a bit tricky. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. Um, I, had tr I have trouble wrapping my, ra my brain around this still. So the idea that now you need to look ahead, basically. You need to peek into the stack. Uh, the core product team builds their thing. Bring us back, the program team integrates that, and that can go back because we know what's coming next. We can have them start working on it. And then, just a moment. Uh, actually, go ahead. Well, you might actually begin in this, but what happens if so migration needs to finish for the program team to be finished? Well, the, the way you draw your diagram. What happens yeah. if your custom reports finishes beforehand? Now, there were, where would their work go since they're going to be waiting for the program team to actually finish? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't know if I can repeat it. Um, <laughs> the, the question is, is um, you know, these guys are all working in parallel. And the, the, uh, the core product team has just brought some work in. What, where does that work go? Is that a fair way of? Well, that, that work would technically go to the program team if they're waiting for it. 
Right. But customer reports finished their work. Mm -hmm. That program team was waiting for and got new work. Yeah. What happens if they finish before the program team is really ready for that new work? Okay. So the question is, is so now the customer reports team, let's back up a little bit. Customer reports team brought in some work, gave it to the program team who starts integrating it, and then they, the program team says, well, here's what I need next. Go prepare that. And they go work on that. Now, what if the customer reports team is working so much faster than everybody else that they finish that and it comes back? Well, just like in manufacturing Kanban, it sits here, right here, until the program team is waiting for, ready for it, which means now the customer reports team doesn't do any more work. Just like in manufacturing, you don't want to run your teams or your equipment full time because that leads to a lot of build up inventory. So use the Kanban to control how much inventory is being done and, and what people are working on. So these folks in that scenario would now just wait. What do they do with their time? Well, maybe they finally get to have a vacation, first time in two years. Or maybe, um, maybe what they can do is start paying down technical debt that they've been putting off. They can do build automation. They can perhaps look at the whole system and say, well, you know, what, what are we missing here? So they c there are ways for them to use that time effectively that doesn't involve building new inventory. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can they help the migration? They could go help the migration. There are some, there are some caveats to that, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, which has to do with programmers not coming out of vending machines and being plug replaceable. Um, so let me, let me st that was a, interesting aside, but I'm going to start this over just so everybody can see it from the beginning. So starting from the beginning, request comes in from the customer. That signals, that gives us the information we need to get everybody started on their work. We then take that request and say it's in process, which allows us to take another request from the customer, which now gives us the ability to queue up additional work if necessary. Customer reports team does their work, brings it back, starts integrating it core product, and then they can go back because we know what's next. Core product team does their work, brings it in, program team starts integrating it, that can go back because we know what's next. Migration team finishes their work, brings it in, integrates it, and we know what's next, so that can go back as well. Then the program team finishes up their integration work and ships off to the customer. And then we continue on. Now, just as with the dance of the Kanban, this is something that could happen. It happens more simultaneously than we, than we see here. I was not able to create that animation. So, <laughs> and I tried. I really tried, but it's, uh, I, I couldn't do it. Um, and of course, the, what I was showing there was the same thing happening over and over again, but that's not really how it worked. Different teams would come back at different speeds for different problems. Uh, yes? Um, is this assuming that your customer is also, you know, following the lean um, approach? Uh, so, yeah. More? So the question is, are, can we assume the customer is also following a lean Kanban-based approach? Um, well, in this case, when I say customer, I mean the actual end user. And the, um, it's the job of the product manager on that customer facing team to manage the amount of work that they've got coming in. Now you can queue up, you know, 20 ideas that will take you five years to deliver. And there's not a huge amount of harm in that, but know that all except the first five will never happen because more work will come in and, and jump the queue. So it's more effective and it's less stressful if you just limit your work and process even at that at the front end. But that's not limited by the end customer so much as it's limited by the product manager or program manager. So then help me understand, how is this any different than saying you have you know, a team responsible for managing the requirements and they form the capacity of your you know, programmers or your foundation teams? You just pick them up and get them and spend the work to your customers. How is that any different? How is this different than people just picking up what they can? Well, I'm illustrating a pretty simple example here. Um, if you only have three teams with a program team, now I am assuming that the program team actually has to do integration work, programming to integrate all the pieces together or testing or, or so forth. 
But um, if you only have a few teams with a few dependencies, I don't know that you need to do Kanban. Uh, it's just much easier to visualize with a small example than it is with a big example. But if you've got more dependencies, then you've got more of a need to, to manage this. So a more realistic example is one where you might have a services team supporting these other teams. So now you've got additional Kanban that these teams are going to use to pull work from the services team. Uh, presumably not every single time. Uh, Otherwise, we'd need more than one services team, or we'd need to manage that staffing in some way. Now, uh, I have a real world example. Everything I've shown you so far is based on uh, this real world example, but simplified. This is a very rough, high level view of something that the focus, folks at Algorithmics do. Uh, Algorithmics is a local company that does extreme programming in large scale Agile. And um, they told me a little bit about how they were approaching their team. So I, I tried to sketch that out, what that might look like if you were doing Kanban in that environment. Now, we haven't actually gone through that exercise with them, so I don't think I got this right. But uh, uh, it doesn't reflect their work exactly, but it's a, it's a better real world example. So what they have is they have many teams that all have product managers that are customer facing. So their reporting team actually delivers directly to customers. This is kind of to what you, the points you were making. Their data migration team works directly with customers. Uh, I'm not sure about their industry connectivity team, but let's say that they work directly with customers as well. Um, then their web UI team is going to be working directly with customers, and their core team is working directly with customers as well. However, their web UI team does depend on the core team, which also depends on their automation team, who does stuff like um, performance automation, performance test automation, and so forth. If you actually know algorithms, you know I'm everything I'm saying is not exactly right, but this is close enough. Um, so this shows how you might have something a little more complex. In that environment, there is no integration required, so the delivery to the program manager is more of a formality because um, that work can just go straight to customers. And the program manager is helping keep everybody in mind at the big picture more than acting as a gatekeeper. So uh, does, this, does this make sense in the context of the simple example I gave? OK. Um, Algo, by the way, uh, is a company that, I'm sorry? It's hiring. It's hiring, yes. Um, <laughs> is a company that really knows what they're doing with regards to Agile. So if you want to do Agile well, talk to Richard Barton uh, over here. He's their program manager. So yes? Um, so, so when you say the web UI team depends on the core and desktop team, mm -hmm. the, uh, I guess I'm, the, this is the direction of the sort of like come on, where do customer requirements come from? Right? Like, so when a customer does a like something, right? all, all the arrows seem to, you know, like how, how does work show up as automation? OK. So I'm going to come up with a completely made up example. Um, let's say that the program manager, is this OK that I'm using you as an example like this? Oh, he gave me permission <laughs> earlier, but now we're going into more details. So um, I'm not going to give away any secrets. Uh, so, so this is a product company. They sell a product to banks. Um, so it's not so much necessarily that the customers are coming in and saying, deliver us this feature. But the, the people at Algo are talking to customers and discovering what they want. And so at some point, from a big picture perspective, Richard and his team are going to decide, what do we want to deliver in our next release? Or you know, what do we want to have the web UI do that's going to matter to customers? So that creates the Kanban here. They're going to say, well, that's going to require some work from the web UI folks in terms of uh, how, what we see from the web UI team. And it's also going to need some stuff from the data migration folks. So they'll send out a Kanban to the data migration team and to the web UI team. The web UI team gets that Kanban and says, well, doing that work is going to require us to do a fair amount, and we're going to need some changes from the core team. So they send a Kanban to the core team while they start working on, on their work. The core team looks at that and says, yeah, we can deliver that. 
The automation team is doing stuff that helps us be more effective, but they're not a dependency for us delivering to customers. So they do their work, fill that Kanban, send it back to the web UI team. The web UI team integrates that, sends it back to Richard. Uh, Richard, because he's not doing development work, is more, is not really a stage, but he's, He's helping monitor the whole, the whole system. And also, uh, uh, the data migration folks are come back with their stuff. Richard looks at it and says, yeah, this works together the way I thought it would. And then, at some point, they release a new version of the software. It goes off to customers. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Any other questions about this? The, uh, the way the Kanban interacts in a large-scale Agile system? Yeah. So the question is, uh, the team should be cross-functional, have a product person, but it doesn't look like that. Uh, there is actually, in, in reality, Algo has a product person on each of these teams. Do you want to say a, a few words about that, Richard? Yeah, we, 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 we do. Um, so, so I'm, I'm sort of responsible for all the product management and everything The industry connectivity folks do face customers. Yeah. So, so to repeat for the people on the live stream, uh, yes, there is a subject matter expert on every team. And my understanding is that the teams do deliver directly to customers in a lot of cases and are responsible for understanding their market. Yeah. Like the data migration team figures out who, what, who needs to migrate and what they need and, and takes responsibility for, figure, for doing that delivery. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering about, say, the automation team. So the automation team um, is serving the rest of the teams, and they're doing stuff like build automation, test uh, certain types of test automation, and so forth. So uh, it sounds like what you said is they do have somebody who's acting as a product owner or product manager. It's something we've struggled with, and, and, and to be honest, the, the, that, that team and its development um, sort of been frustrated without necessarily feeling there has been somebody to give that direction. But I think we are uh, solving the problem. Um, Andre, I think you had a question. Yeah, so, do you consider these different boxes independently marketable or, or independent products? Like, um, it actually it actually varies within that. So, um, reporting is is something that we sold with. I mean, it sounds to me like you're selling to IT departments, which are very technical, bank kind of very technical consumers. So it looks like a technical breakdown, but I think the way you're talking about it sounds like a product it's based actually, breakdown. Yeah, it's very much a product. And, I, and yeah. I, it's just it's just not obvious from the slides. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, it, it, it is it is pretty much product product offering or something. Okay, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 And again, for the camera, um, the question was. This looks like a technical breakdown, but in fact, it's a product breakdown. Um, reporting isn't so much, I mean, 
we're going to get into, there's, there's a need for a technical breakdown that matches a market breakdown. But um, uh, there's, a, there's a real customer need for customer ports. And there's a customer need for data migration, which is about migrating between versions of the application, uh, getting from the old version to the current version, and so forth. I'm going to go ahead and move on. We've got, we have 10 minutes left, correct? OK. So, so this is the core idea is work cells plus Kanban. Now, there are a lot of things to consider, a lot of nuances, and I'm going to share some of them with you now. Uh, the first is uh, respect the software. And by respect the software, I mean respect the fundamental nature of software. Software development is not at all like manufacturing. And we have to respect that when we, when we do this work. So software, for example, tends to be write only. <laughs> not, it's not read only, it's write only. Um, software rots. You leave it alone long enough, you don't pay enough attention to it, it will rot. And in software development, gelled teams are far more productive than non-gelled teams. This is a creative endeavor and people have to be able to communicate well and get along well with each other and have effective communication styles in order to get, do good productive work. So each team should be completely responsible for every bounded context that it, that it owns. So don't split bounded contexts across teams. A bounded context is a concept from Eric Evans from his book Domain Driven Design. And it basically says a part of the system that is got a clear boundary. And within that boundary, you can change anything without affecting anybody else. And outside that boundary, uh, you need to have an API or some other formal mechanism. So every team should have its own bounded context. The team should own code quality, so you can be, you know, have collective ownership and pay down technical debt and good do test-driven development and create long-lived teams, partly so they gel, but partly because software is right only and it just takes a long time to learn a new piece of code. So you want your team to really understand its, uh, the bounded contexts that it owns. And this actually comes back to what you were saying earlier, Andre, about how these look like technical breakdowns. What you want is something that's a good technical breakdown and a good market breakdown. And that's, again, part of the art of this that I think there's still learning to be done about, how the, best, about the best way to do that. Second, uh, respect the system. So handoffs, by system I mean all the teams that, the, the, the system of multiple teams, the large scale agile system. Uh, handoffs create delay and error. How many of you remember the Mars Climate Orbiter? A few hands. This was back in 1999. It was a $655 million project to send a spacecraft to Mars. One team worked in Newtons. Another team worked in Pound Force. The orbiter got to Mars and disappeared. $655 million down the drain. That's a handoff between two teams. That, that kind of thing happens. I mean. NASA is actually known for not having that kind of thing happen, but it still happens even to them. Uh, so everywhere you have a handoff, uh, you're going to have delay and error. Um, perfect upfront architecture of a large system is impossible. Upfront architecture isn't impossible. Perfect upfront architecture is impossible. And, um, the, and also, your constraints are going to be shifting. It's not like a manufacturing line where you're always building the same thing. Well even they're not always building the same thing. But it's not as predictable. You're not building the same thing over and over again. Every single thing you build is new. It's new product development or new feature development or something like that. Which means that the time things take is going to change quite a bit. And your bottlenecks are going to shift around and move. So um, we want to minimize the number of handoffs. We want to favor throughput over reuse. And this is kind of a bad word for a lot of programmers who, you know, we're taught we want to reuse, 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 abstract everything, build everything out into a module. But if you start reusing something that somebody else has built, now you have a dependency on them. Every time you want that to change because they own the bounded contexts, you have to go to them. Now you can create structures so that two teams can, can change a single system and maybe you've got an owner more like a source, open source environment. But you're still creating uh, complexity around that. So if it's small, it might be better just to copy that code and change it. Yes, I did just say cut and paste programming. <laughs> That's a difference in large scale Agile versus single team Agile. 
Um, and feral architects. You want to have ro bands of roving architects uh, stalking through your system, joining teams, working as programmers on those teams for a couple of weeks, getting back together on a regular basis and saying, this is what I'm seeing in the system. These are the, where the duplication is. This is where the bottlenecks are. Um, by feral architects, I mean architects that actually know how to code and get in and get right down in the details, but are also thinking about the big picture and who are helping create a learning organization. And third, respect the people. Uh, large systems are confusing. And we as people have this tendency to form tribes. So if you've got a team, then that team is going to tend to start to think of itself as being the cool people and everybody else as being in their way. Um, this, I wouldn't say this is happening to Algo, but it is certainly possible for the web team to say, we're doing cool webby stuff. And those .NET people on the core team who are always preventing us from getting our work done, they're bad people because they're not giving us what we want. We form tribes and then we fling poo at each other. So, um, miscommuni and miscommunication is really easy. So, and also as people, we need autonomy, we need a sense of autonomy, we need a sense of achievement, and we need a sense of belonging. So address these by uh, using visual control. Visual control is a lean term. It just means make the system really visible, make what's going on in the system really visible. If a team is held up, you know, put up a big red flag over their workspace so that anybody can see. Or if a team is starved for, uh, for material, put up Put up something that you can see easily. And between teams, be really clear, very actually even formal, about what the relationships between teams are, what, how bounded contexts interact, how teams interact. And this is a different, most of Agile is about being rigorous but informal, but I think in large scale Agile, between teams, you need to be pretty formal and be very clear about how those boundaries work out. I don't mean that everybody has to put on a suit and tie and you know, shake hands when they talk to each other, but you understand how that communication is expected to take place and is meant to take place, even if that just means tossing, tossing a note in a campfire chat room. That's still a defined way of communicating. Um, the teams that have to interact uh, should talk to each other on a regular basis. I call these overlapping stand-up circles. So you've got your stand-up within your team, but also teams that are interacting frequently, they should form stand-ups too and talk about what's going on that uh, they all care about. Um, and then we want teams that own their own work. So the reporting team in Richard's example should be really responsible for understanding reporting and guided by the, by the program direction that Richard provides, but they're the experts in what customers want in reporting and they should be responsible for that. And finally, respect competence. Uh, to do large scale Agile well, you must first do single team actually well. So in closing, large scale agile is about work cells, competent agile teams that are cross-functional and work in simultaneous phases, one piece flow using Kanban, and creating a learning organization that is about decreasing Kanban, decreasing handoffs, and creating an environment where teams can own their work and talk directly with customers. So, Thank you for t your time. My name is James Shore. I've got a training course about single team Agile done well coming up in a week and a half that is in New York City. That's artofagilenyc.com. And there's my blog, email, and stuff. So thank you for coming.